Hey, everybody, this is Harvey Sugga Wasserman. This is a special edition of the um, uh, Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Show uh, uh, for Progressive Radio Network and for the, for the internet. Uh, we are going to discuss the ongoing situation at, uh, uh, in Ukraine and nuclear power in general. There's been some uh, amazing developments as we continue. Uh, my understanding, uh, and we're with the great Linda Pence Gunter of Beyond Nuclear. We will be joined by Paul Gunter uh, and by uh, also of Beyond Nuclear and by Joe Mangano of the Radiation and Health Project. Um, uh, Linda, uh, my understanding is that uh, one of the first things that's happened and probably the only good thing that has happened uh, as a result of this insanity in Ukraine is that the uh, Finland had a deal with Russia to build a new nuclear plant and uh, it appears that that has been canceled. Uh, do you have any knowledge on that? I don't have any more details than, than you've just described, but obviously that's a trend that should continue. Um, yeah. you, every time something like this happens, you hope it's a wake up call and that people wake up and start to realize that this is an inherently dangerous technology. We wouldn't even have to have this program if there weren't nuclear power plants in Ukraine. So uh, that ought to wake people up to the reality that it's time to end the use of this technology because the risks are just too high. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we would not be uh, worrying about all this if Putin was threatening to blow up Ukraine's uh, windmills or solar panels. So um, uh, we also, the Russians have been in the business in the last few years of selling uh, reactor projects to other countries. Um, are you familiar with uh, the other countries that they've been selling them to? I'm gonna to defer to Paul on that because he's our reactor expert to talk about the, you know, the, Rus the particular Russian style of reactor I understand is the one that they use now is relatively on par with our pressurized water reactors, but Paul's joined us, so I'll let him address that. Yeah, well, okay, well while we have you land up, Hey, Paul. Good to see you. Hey, thank um, you, Kirby. Uh, you're looking dapper. I like the, I like the hat. Um, so, um, Linda, in your time, I know you've got to leave. Um, uh, what, what, we'll come back to the Russian, other Russian reactors that they've been selling around the world. Paul, uh, you're, you're a bit tardy, but we, we did mention that uh, the one good thing we can say has come out of this horror show in Ukraine <clears throat> is that Finland has canceled its proposed uh, reactor project with the Russians. So um, um, that, that is a plus. Uh, at least there's one plus that we can talk about uh, from this horrible nightmare. Linda, um, what would you like to add in terms of what's going on here in Ukraine? Uh, I, I have been scaring the heck out of people um, uh, about the, the potential uh, disaster that we're looking at here. Uh, what can you tell us from your uh, boundless knowledge? Yeah, since last we talked, I don't know that there have been any particularly dramatic developments. We, we dodged a nuclear bullet at Zaporozhye, maybe. I mean, we still don't really know at the six reactor site that's now occupied Russia was sold, um, what the uh, statuses of the staff, for example, the workforce, that we do understand that they may have been working endlessly long shifts. We hope that there have been shift change because obviously tired workers leads to potential for error. And that's where it all started at Chernobyl. Yeah, it was human, partly it was human error. So, um, and certainly at Three Mile Island also. So we're keeping an eye on that, but there are three other nuclear power plant sites. Uh, the Russian military remains somewhat on the move, even if they appear to be stalled outside Kyiv. So the fears continue about what could happen uh, if and when they decide to take over the other three sites, which one presumes they might, since there is, one assumes, uh, an interest here in controlling the power sources in the country. And as we've said before, the four nuclear power plant sites represent about 50% of Ukraine's electricity. So if the Russians are in involved in some sort of coup d'etat, which means taking over the country, they'll want to be in control of that. And um, we, so far, we haven't seen any effort to occupy the other three sites, but one could imagine that that's an inevitability. Well, my understanding is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that 12 of the 15 reactors in Ukraine 
uh, went online before the fall of the Soviet Union. But they are bigger um, and more advanced than the one that blew up at Chernobyl. Um, is that correct? A different design. So the one that blew up in Chernobyl was an RMBK, and I know Paul can elaborate on that later in the show, didn't have a secondary containment, was graphite moderated. These are pressurized water reactors more on a par with the ones that we're familiar with. Um, so they are more robust or, you know, I would say less dangerous. I wouldn't say they're safer. They're just less dangerous than Chernobyl in terms of being embattled, but it doesn't mean to say that they can withstand uh, artillery fusillade or a war zone or a bombing. So uh, the, the problem with them is that they're much more dangerous in the sense of their radioactive inventory because they're old reactors with large radioactive inventories and Chernobyl was a, at the time relatively new reactor with a smaller radioactive inventory. If they're breached, the kind of contamination that they would release uh, is much bigger. So um, even though on the one hand it's a less dangerous design, it's a more dangerous situation because they're older reactors with more radioactivity in them with a potential to release, you know, a plume, a radioactive plume that would dwarf the Chernobyl disaster. Oh my God. And they, they are, uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, nameplate, uh, boroughplate capacity, they are larger, I believe, than Chernobyl. They're about a thousand megawatts each. So, for example, the output at the six reactor site that got taken over is 5,700 megawatts. So, yeah, that's that's the typical size. Now, the Russians, before this happened, uh, Russia was on, under contract to run Ukraine's reactors. Now, my understanding is that uh, the government of Ukraine was trying to phase in uh, Westinghouse. Is that right? That I'm not familiar with, but I. Okay. Now we did have a report at you know at uh, um, uh, Zaporozhye that um, um, the the Russians had uh, fired on a building at the Zaporozhye site, and then were shooting at firefighters who were trying to put the fire out. Are you familiar with that? I didn't hear the latter part. What I understood was that there was firing on the building and that the, because it became embroiled in a conflict, the firefighters could not go in to, at first, to put the fire out. Now, you couldn't rush into a scene where there were, you know, hails of bullets flying above. But I didn't hear that they were directly attacked. The firefighters were directly attacked. It's very difficult to get verifiable uh, sourced information out. There's a lot of propaganda from all sides trying to frame it one way or the other. So to really know uh, without somebody on the ground there who's a credible eyewitness, it's very hard to know what transpired in that time. But the building that was uh, hit was mercifully not one of the nuclear buildings. It was a auxiliary training building. Um, so again, you know, luck prevailed. We, we don't know whether they fired on that building because they knew what it was or whether they just fired at the nuke and luckily didn't hit it, you know? So um, all of these things are sort of foggy to say the least, but it was put out by the firefighting personnel. And as I understand it, um, it's a very concerning situation because we don't know whether the workforce at that site and at Chernobyl um, certainly at Chernobyl, we understand that they've been doing very long indefinite shifts. You know, we don't know what the condition is of that workforce vis-a-vis -vis exhaustion, trauma, uh, anxiety about what's happening on the outside to their families and so forth. So it's um, by no means an ideal situation when you want people to be running something as dangerous as a nuclear power plant, as inherently dangerous as a nuclear power plant. Well, let me ask you what I'm asked all the time, which is what would it take, God forbid, to cause a Chernobyl uh, in any one of the reactors at Zaporozhye or at the other three sites? Well, as you know, I mean, if, if the reactor loses site power and then on-site power, whether because it was struck directly or whether because the grid goes down, whether they lose their backup diesel generators, which is what they have to rely on if they cannot get electricity from the grid, then the reactor starts to heat up, the fuel pools start to heat up and boil and drain down. Then you're exposing fuel rods. You're looking at potential for explosions, for fire, and massive 
a meltdown and massive releases of radioactivity. And as we said earlier, because these are such big facilities with, in the case of Zaporozhye, six reactors, uh, one hopes it's not all six, you know, but even if it's one of them, um, the amount of radioactivity that would be released would be a lot more than was released by the original Chernobyl disaster. So that's why it's so imperative that nothing happened at any of these sites. And everybody's holding their breath. The IEA is making sort of, you know, noises of anxiety, but so far doesn't seem able or, to do anything proactive about this. Um, and they're not directly in touch with the workforce to know what's going on on the inside. So it's just a perilous situation. Do we know anything about what's happening at Chernobyl itself? Well, the reports we've been seeing through the various sources that we're able to see suggest that they're engaged in extremely long shifts and they haven't been able to do proper shift changes there. And that is of concern, clearly. And the other thing we don't really know, but certainly the impression we get is that the occupying forces, uh, the occupying Russian forces at both Chernobyl and Zaporozhye are not nuclear engineers, they're military personnel, which means they won't necessarily have any expertise about what should or could be happening. And to operate under that kind of duress and fear potentially is uh, again, a high risk situation. These are very sensitive, delicate things, you know, <clears throat> can't operate like that under uh, sort of military control if, if you've got people calling the shots who don't know the technology and don't know what ought to be happening. So, and it's not clear, you know, the other thing that's not clear is really why they've occupied these sites. And as I said earlier, I think, you know, it's, it seems I don't believe I don't really buy into the idea that they just sort of stumbled upon them along the way and they were just sort of there on their route in and so they had to take them. Um, they didn't have to take them. Nobody had to shell Zaporozhye. So therefore, why take them? And it's presumably part if if in fact we're looking at a coup underway uh, and a regime change, then it's presumably an effort to control the power sources of the country, of which these rep represent fifty percent. Oh, my God. And what are the implications, before you go, what are the implications for the 93 reactors operating in the United States? Well, I know that Paul can address this in, in, in great detail, but I would say just briefly that any reactor anywhere is vulnerable because they rely on electricity, off-site electricity, to power them. And then if that goes down, back up on-site electricity, which may not work in the first place, or if it does, can't last forever, it's a diesel generator. They are all vulnerable to even uh, just a simple loss of power. And that can happen. You don't need a war. You don't need a tsunami. You don't even need an earthquake necessarily to cause the electricity grid. It could be cyber attacked. It could be a raccoon climbing up a light bulb, which is what happened before. You know, it could be a branch falling in an ice storm. All these things can knock out power. And if you're then relying on something that might not be reliable, you know, the risk of it failing is so enormous. I mean, as you said earlier in the show, Harvey, I mean, if, if you lose power to a wind turbine or a solar array, you're not suddenly risking the lives and well beings of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands or millions of people. When this happens at a nuclear plant, that's what's at stake. It's not a risk worth taking. So obviously the 93 reactors in this country, we believe at Beyond Nuclear, should be rapidly phased out uh, because we should not be gambling with the lives of the American people in this way. However unlikely you might think this to be, it's a very real possibility every single day that they continue to operate. Man, and uh, how many uh, do we have worldwide? How many worldwide? It's in the 400 range, I think, but I'd have to look at the exact number. Okay. There's, there's a, All right. Um, well, Linda. Because sometimes it says operating, but it really means operationable, operatable. They're not all operating. So some of them are still there. Their technique could be operated if they were on, but they're not on. So the best source for that is the World Nuclear Industry Status Report, which makes that distinction between what the international nuclear authorities want to tell you is operating and what's actually in operation. But thank you for having me on. I'm sorry I have to go, but- um, okay. Linda Gunter of uh, Beyond Nuclear.
uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, I don't, I'm not sleeping very well at night, and I'm sure you're not either. Uh, but we appreciate Linda Gunter of uh, Beyond Nuclear. This is Paul Gunter. Uh, I don't know if Joe Mangano has joined us yet. Um, um, if we can see, um, uh, uh, I don't see him on the screen. Uh, Paul, I am here, Harvey. Oh, you are here. Okay, yes. great, Joe. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Joe Mangano has joined us from Radiation and Health Project. We're going to proceed a little more with Paul Gunter, talk some about the uh, health implications, and uh, we'll go back and forth. Uh, this is Harvey Wasserman. We are at the Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Show at Progressive Radio Network. Uh, our weekly Zoom uh, on, on the grassroots emergency election protection will resume uh, uh, next week, um, uh, and we'll continue with that at PRN. Uh, but this is a special report uh, on the absolutely terrifying apocalyptic realities of um, at um, in, U in Ukraine at the nuclear plants. I have had a number of pieces published. Uh, one is that uh, uh, two actually are at uh, uh, the re Reader Supported News, rsn.org. Uh, there's one at progressive.org and one at downwithtyranny.org uh, uh, in addition to uh, others uh, around the web, they get, these two articles do tend to get picked up. Uh, Paul Gunter, uh, how many uh, reactors are there in the world? Um, and what, uh, what uh, the, the Russians have been in the business of selling uh, new reactor projects. As I mentioned at the top, uh, the only good thing I can think of that's come out of this horror show in Ukraine is that Finland and Russia had an agreement to build a new nuclear plant. And when uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, Finland canceled that plant, uh, uh, that project. Uh, can you tell me if that's accurate and what's happening with other uh, proposed uh, Russian reactor projects around the world? Well, thanks, Sluggo, for having me on. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't have a current number for the uh, worldwide nuclear plant population, you know, uh, we're about to close the Palisades nuclear power station in Michigan next month. So it'll be one less, but I think it's somewhere around 435. Uh, but um, again, as Linda had pointed out, um, this doesn't, think, you know, there, that number counts uh, I believe about 35 Japanese reactors that are not operating. They're still uh, under a Fukushima Daiichi uh, shutdown order uh, that uh, they have to go through uh, uh, a lot of testing and validation before they're allowed to operate. They also have to go through a political approval process that involves the local mayors uh, who can keep these reactors shut down if they don't believe that they have invested uh, either in uh, design changes or um, maintenance activities, uh, or for that matter, public confidence to uh, allow them to continue to operate. So while the International Atomic Energy Agency will count those Japanese reactors among the uh, operable units. They're not actually operational right now. So, uh, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> Russia is constantly uh, promoting uh, nuclear technology. Uh, they're a lot as as China is as well. They're looking at Africa as one of the um, sites. The Middle East is another. I know that Russia's got some designs uh, before the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, who are look Saudi Arabia is uh, shopping around the entire world. Uh, Russia, the United States, China, France, South Korea, um, Japan is even marketed. Uh, but uh, Saudi Arabia is looking to build um, at least 16 new reactor units in um, Saudi Arabia. They have refused to sign the uh, non-proliferation treaty, uh, which means that Saudi Arabia intends 
to enrich its own uranium um, without uh, signing the agreement that it could enrich up to weapons grade, which is one of the biggest problems with nuclear power is that it provides um, basically that you could become a dual purpose producer of enriched uranium or plutonium reprocessing uh, and make nuclear weapons, materials, and electricity on a handshake. This is essentially what happened in, in uh, North Korea, where they were originally a signator of the non-proliferation treaty, but broke it after they uh, had weapons capable production. But you know, um, I, I think it would be worth spending a little bit of time just talking about the biggest implications of the um, Russian nuclear expansion uh, globally uh, with regards to, uh, you know, why would any government recognize Russia as a partner in a nuclear weapons and particularly a nuclear fuel deal uh, when in fact Russia's attacking nuclear power stations in Ukraine. Most people don't know that Russia uh, and uh, it, the, uh, its control territories in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan make 35% of the enriched uranium for the world. 47% of the United States enriched uranium comes from Kazakhstan, Russia, and Uzbekistan. And while you've got the U.S. State Department and the Biden administration talking about boycotting um, Russian oil, which is about 7% of the global uh, consumption, they are ignoring the fact that the United States energy security relies right now on cheap Russian uh, nuclear fuel. And that, in fact, Reuters and Bloomberg News just reported last week that the U.S. nuclear industry, through its lobby organization, the Nuclear Energy Institute, has gone to the Biden administration to say, do not embargo Russian uranium. We need it because if you uh, ban cheap Russian nuclear fuel, we're not going to be able to compete on the U.S. electric market, and particularly for our merchant plants. And you know, if you if you if you're regulated through a state public utility commission, you can just pass that cost of fuel on to the ratepayers. But if you're operating on a free market as a merchant nuclear power plant, you have to eat that cost if you have to get um, your uranium, enriched uranium and fuel from the common market and um, not from um, Russia, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. So why would anybody at this point, including the United States and the Biden administration, why would we continue to rely for our energy security to rely on Russia right now? I mean, it's a violation of uh, of our of our security, and in fact, uh, you know, we should be effectively uh, banning Russian fuel. Um, but as it is right now, the Nuclear Energy Institute has no sense of what energy security really constitutes. When they talk about energy security, it's about their own financial security, not U.S. or global security. And, and that's, right. that's one yeah. of the biggest problems we've got going right now is this um, desperate uh, difference between uh, uh, financial agendas and security and safety agendas. Right, and we have a situation in the U.S. where we have enough power. We don't need the nuclear plants in many cases, and uh, they're, they're jeopardizing our security. 
I want to bring in uh, Joe Mangano. This is Paul Gunter uh, on the uh, Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Show at PRN, uh, with, uh, hosted by me, Harvey Wasserman. Uh, this is an emergency special edition to uh, get us updated on what's happening uh, in Ukraine with the nuclear power plants. Joe Mangano, and Paul, if you'll stay with us, we'll come back to you, please. Uh, uh, Joe Mangano, uh, one of the world's leading experts on the health impacts of radiation, especially as uh, 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 coming from nuclear power plants. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, Joe, what? <laughs> I'm going to ask you the big question because um, people are asking me, and um, uh, we are in a situation now where we have 15, count them, 15 uh, commercial atomic reactors operating in Ukraine. As best I can tell, all of them are bigger than Chernobyl was. Certainly, all of them having operated for 30 years or thereabouts, at least 12 are, have been operating for 30 years. They have enormous inventories of radioactive material. So here's the big question. What would happen? What would the implications be for the future of the human race if Vladimir Putin got up on the wrong side of the bed and blew up all 15 reactors in Ukraine? What would the, what would the health implications be for, the, for our species? Well, let me answer that in, in two parts, Harvey. First of all, what happened at Chernobyl and then leading into what could potentially happen with the Ukrainian reactors? Uh, Chernobyl is one of the two worst uh, meltdowns in world history, along with Fukushima Daiichi in 2011. It occurred in 1986. The health impacts are still being counted. Probably the best source was a 2009 book put together by a team of Russian scientists headed by Alexei Yablokov, who was a former advisor to Gorbachev and Yeltsin, the name of the book is Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for Health and the Environment. And what they did was take 5,000 studies, most of them in Russian and Slavic languages, most had never been published before. And they compiled estimates of what happened uh, to human health in the first 20 years after Chernobyl. It's now been 30, almost 36 years. Several things they came up with. Number one, they estimated 985,000 deaths in the first uh, 19 years after the meltdown. Number two, they calculated that before the meltdown, uh, local children in areas of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, 80% of the children were considered healthy. And after the meltdown, only 20% of the children were considered healthy. And finally, I can't emphasize enough that these studies didn't include just the usual uh, uh, health uh, effects, such as thyroid cancer or child cancer. They were in there, of course, but virtually uh, studies of every disease uh, in, the, in the human body, every organ system showed increases. I mean, not just cancer, but things like lung diseases and digestive diseases and, and endocrine diseases and mental diseases, uh, neurological diseases, all showed increases in, in the local area. It, it, it was devastating. Unfortunately, the the um, agencies like the IAEA uh, have not recognized the, the Yablokov book. Their, their estimates of what happened from Chernobyl were, are much less, somewhere around 9,000 cancer cases, which is, which is just a tremendous undercount. So anyway, that, that's, that's step one, what happened after Chernobyl. We have to remember that Chernobyl was, first of all, only one of the four cores melted down as bad as it was, the other three were unaffected. And also Chernobyl was a relatively new plant, which meant there wasn't a whole lot of waste that had been used uh, on the plant. And, and, and of course they were unaffected as well. 
Now, step two of my answer. In the Ukraine today, <clears throat> as my colleague Paul has mentioned, there are 15 uh, operating nuclear reactors. Okay? Each, of, each of them with, with a core uh, containing huge amounts of radioactive chemicals, over 100 different chemicals that are not found in nature, all radioactive, all cancer causing. And as you, you said, Harvey, these reactors, out of the 15, 12 of them began operating in the 1980s. The other three came on a little later. So they've accumulated a massive amount of nuclear waste, which are stored either in deep pools of water or in concrete casks. M massive meaning far, far more than whatever what, what was at Chernobyl in 1986. And this, this waste, uh, a colleague of mine, Bob Alvarez, did a, a study of the U.S. waste. About 90% are three different chemicals. One is plutonium, one is strontium-90, one is cesium-37. They, they stick around a long time. Their decay rates are, are quite slow. So they will be with us for hundreds and thousands of years. And we recognize plutonium as perhaps even among the 100 plus radioactive chemicals as being one of the more toxic, one of the more devastating. Uh, strontium-90 is, is another one that gets into the, the bone of, of humans and enters the bone marrow where the immune system gets its, its strength. And, and cesium-137 distributes through human tissues. All this is bad. And so my, my answer would be that, you know, the, if the unthinkable happened and multiple cores were affected, such as the, the reactor that was attacked last week, the six, the six cores were attacked and the waste repositories, the pools and the casks were attacked, the releases would be far, far more than Chernobyl. It would dwarf what happened at Chernobyl and thus the casualties would dwarf Chernobyl's in the, in the many millions, Harvey. It would be a tragedy just unparalleled in human history. And um, what would the implications be for the people in the United States? People in the United States and around the world, the implications are that while <clears throat> radioactivity and the environment are highest, closest to the source, there is no stopping radioactivity. It gets into the prevailing winds and it blows around. For example, the Chernobyl uh, fallout went around the world. It, it, it went to the United States, for example, uh, right over the North Pole and into the United States, oh, about arriving about eight or nine days after the meltdown and was um, absorbed into the food chain into fruits and vegetables and milk and water and thus into the human diet. Americans ate and drank Chernobyl fallout uh, after, after the meltdown. The same thing happened at, at Fukushima, you know, four, four days after the meltdown, airborne radioactivity was found at higher levels above, uh, in Washington state and on, on the West coast. And again, humans ate and, and, and drank this radioactivity. There, again, this would be a worldwide crisis. You know, R Russia, who is the country that, that is, is threatening this by their warlike actions, would be affected as well. Russia is not very far from, from Ukraine. Um, it's its own people, not just the soldiers who are fighting the war, but its own People, its citizens, its elderly, its its children, its infants would would be very adversely affected uh, for for years to come. It, it is truly the 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 unthinkable, the the worst uh, catastrophe environmentally we could we could imagine. Short of nuclear war. Well, uh, Paul, do you want to uh, jump into this happy dialogue with uh, Paul Gunter from Beyond Nuclear? This was this we're talking with Joe Mangano from the Radiation and Health Project, uh, one of the world's very top experts on the uh, health impacts of atomic radiation, Paul Gunter from Beyond Nuclear. Um, uh, Paul, do you wanna comment on the health impacts 
of Chernobyl. I want to go in a little deeper, but I want to give you a chance to talk here. Paul yeah, Becker. I, I, uh, I appreciate uh, Joe's thorough uh, evaluation. You know, the only thing that I would add was a bit of history of the Chernobyl accident that would apply to uh, either inadvertent or deliberate attacks on and radioactive releases from the other Ukraine nuclear power stations. When the Chernobyl accident first began on April 26, 1986, um, it was uh, several days, weeks actually, before the Kremlin uh, admitted to the accident uh, and the severity of the radioactive releases. In fact, it wasn't the Kremlin that opened the transparency to what was going on. It was uh, nuclear power plant operators in Sweden that picked up radioactive releases that by the radioactive signature, they could identify that it wasn't coming from any of the Swedish nuclear power stations. And they concluded that an investigation needed to be made into the, um, ru the uh, Russian reactors operating in Ukraine. But Russia did know. And in fact, Russia when Chernobyl blew up, there was a massive radioactive release uh, that was headed um, into Belarus and was headed towards um, into southern Russia. And but they recognized that it was also headed towards Moscow. The radioactive release, the airborne release, was headed towards Moscow. What did Moscow do? They didn't tell the world. They mobilized their Russian aircraft to fly over the radioactive plume that was otherwise a secret, and they seeded it with silver nit with us, you know, um, silver nitrate to um, make it rain. Out. They created a rainstorm in uh, the radioactive cloud, which then deposited concentrations on Belarus. So they sacrificed the population, they sacrificed the world's population, and particularly the people of Ukraine and Belarus, by causing a rain out deliberately over Belarus to keep and protect the Kremlin. And it's very likely that the same, the same tactic could be used and is probably prepared in the inadvertent or deliberate explosion of Ukraine reactors in the battlefield. Russia is prepared to intercede and seed those clouds of radioactivity to cause a rain out before it gets to the Kremlin in particular. You know, I got to say, Paul, I have been dealing with Chernobyl <clears throat> since the get-go, and I have never heard that story. No, it's I, well I, documented. I, um, it's in I, it's well book. documented by Kate, by Kate Walker, the author, but it's a survival manual uh, is the main title. Uh, uh, Joe, you may know the complete title. Yeah, that it's Manual a, that is for an Survival, and the author is Kate Brown of MIT. That is an astonishing story. If I had made that up, uh, people wouldn't believe it. I mean, that is, and we do have in, in, in a, we do have di direct evidence of what a, ra a radioactive rainstorm can do in uh, the Point Reyes Bird Sanctuary, north of San Francisco, in April of, uh, well, actually it was early May of, uh, of, 20, of uh, 1986. Uh, there was a ranger there who for 10 years had been monitoring bird births in the Point Reyes uh, station. And in, uh, there was a rainstorm after Chernobyl 
and the uh, the bird births after 10 years of data, consistent data, in the Point Reyes bird station dropped 60% in the spring of, of 1986. So we know what a rain cloud can do. I, I am astounded by, this is why we do the, these shows, I am astounded by that story, Paul, and yeah. Joe, you're, 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 um, you're backing it up, that the Russians deliberately seeded rainstorms in Belarus to block radiation from coming into Russia. Is that, is that a fair uh, a summary of what you're saying? Is that what happened? Paul, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, and, and even more specifically, it was to protect Moscow. But, you know, let me just say, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I have a deep regard for the Russian people. And there's a big difference between the Kremlin and the Russian people right now. And in fact, when we're talking about nuclear power, we've seen it, Harvey, at Three Mile Island. You right. know, the first, the first, the, the only effective containment in a nuclear power accident is information. And we've seen it time and time and time again. When the nuclear accident occurs, what is most effectively contained is not radioactivity, but the fact that there were releases of radioactivity <clears throat> from Three Mile Island, where well, you know it was all anecdotal because there was no radiological monitoring equipment around uh, Three Mile Island at the time because it was considered an incredible accident. Um, but there well, was anecdotal call, information. There's one. There's one instance. And I'm sure Joe Mangano is aware of this. There were thermoluminescent dosimer, dosimeters scattered around the, the Three Mile Island site to uh, I monitor, I believe, gamma radiation. And uh, there is a famous TMD, thermoluminescent de device, that was on the northwest side, which is where it was expected because of the prevailing winds at the time, most of the radiation would go at least initially. And a, a thermoluminescent dosimeter at Three Mile Island on the northwest side went off scale, which would indicate a massive radiation dose. And <laughs> the, uh, the authorities, and Joan, maybe you know about this, the authorities claimed that it was a, de a defective device because it had gone off scale precisely where the, the majority, the, oh, well, not uh, a, a massive radiation release would have been expected. Are you familiar with that reality, Joe Mangano? Uh, I'm aware of that. And I'll also add that in uh, the time after Three Mile Island, several articles appeared in the medical literature uh, documenting elevated levels of one, one of the radioactive chemicals, xenon-133 in Albany, New York, and in Portland, Maine, which are respectively 250 and 450 miles away from Three Mile Island. They weren't in, in massive doses, but they're certainly well above what was normal. That cloud that came out of Three Mile Island moved with prevailing winds and it moved a large distance. Yes, and I, I will say when I went there in January of 1980 and was interviewing people in their farmhouses and, and, and seeing people's tumors and lesions, and hearing the stories of their dying animals and their cancer cases among human beings and the inability of animals and people to reproduce, um, uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania was denying any health impacts, but there were studies that were done by local people. I mean, the government did a great job of not studying the health impacts of Three Mile Island, but there were people who were um, uh, uh, definitely uh, impacted, and um, uh, I, I, there were studies done. Jane Lee, who lived, uh, I was at her house, who lived within visual uh, range of, of, the act, of the reactors, and her friend Mary Osborne did a very, a classic citizen-style um, uh, epidemiological study of a neighborhood of 550 houses in Lower Swatara County, and they, a township rather, 
And they, they had, you know, just a very, very clear epidemiological case of massive health impacts from Three Mile Island. You still get the industry saying no significant radiation was released at TMI, when in fact they have no idea how much radiation came out and that there were no health impacts, when in fact there were massive health impacts. Would you, Joe Magano, have primarily uh, documented? Yeah, I want, I want to add one thing, uh, Harvey, and, and, and I'm going to circle it back to what's going on in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, we, 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 our, our work is on human health, essentially, but I want to call out um, a Timothy Mousseau, who is a biology professor at the University of South Carolina, has worked rigorously with colleagues and has made numerous trips to the Chernobyl area and the Fukushima area. His work is on plant life and animal life. And a, a quick one sentence summary of what they have found is that even in the years that have gone on since, that, since those meltdowns, the damage to DNA in plants and in animals continues throughout successive generation. I, I want to make this point that there are there are obviously a, a number of toxic substances and pollutants in our environment. You know, there's there's weed killers and there's pesticides and, 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 and many others. But radiation is different. Radiation affects the human genetic makeup. The, the, it gets into the DNA and either destroys cells or destroys it or, or breaks the bands that can lead to um, to disease. There, there, there is all too much evidence that this is what would occur um, in the case of a, a major release in a, from a place like like Ukraine. It, it, in a way, it's it's kind of like nuclear war. I think during the Cuban Missile Crisis, I believe it was Khrushchev who said. You know, in a nuclear war, I would pity the survivors um, in, in a massive release from a nuclear power plant. Uh, the, it wouldn't be just those who, who died quickly. It would, it would be the survivors who would be struggling for, for a mighty long time. I wanted to make that point. Uh, Paul Gunter, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'd pick up <clears throat> on the great work that Tim Mousseau does. I completely agree with Joe on this. Um, that, you know, just as startling is that the releases of the Chernobyl nuclear accident uh, rained down radioactivity on forests and grasslands. And what Joe has documented is that entire uh, microbi microbiological communities are gone. <clears throat> particularly the, the microbiological community responsible for decay is gone to the point that um, forests are building up uh, the, the, the floor, uh, uh, the bed of fallen materials and trees and limbs and leaves. And the detritus is not decaying because that cycle of life has been significantly diminished, if not disappeared, so that decay is no longer happening. I mean, it's like a new concept on the zombie effect of nuclear power in that uh, it is, you know, no longer um, while dead, but not decaying. And it, what this has done as a result is it's created this incredible fire load in these forests. And um, when, when there are fires, inevitably there will be fires because there's more stuff to burn. And what it does is it just then incinerates that fuel load and then re -lofts the radioactivity, which according to the National Geographic, which published um, an anniversary issue 
uh, about 10, maybe 20 years later. I'd have to look it up. But, but what they showed was the exclusion zone around Chernobyl is growing because of these fires that spread on the smoke the radioactivity. And it just keeps moving and contaminating and drying and burning and moving. And so the, the exclusion zone is actually growing, not diminishing. It's staggering what, what's being done. We're, we're really cutting through to the core of the ecosystems on which the human race survive. And of course, radiation uh, cuts to the core of the genome. Um, it's really the end of the world as we know it. And um, uh, God forbid, uh, I mean, we're sitting on tenter hooks here uh, with uh, these 15 reactors in Ukraine that could go off at any minute. Uh, that would not even take uh, 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 a, a conscious decision uh, by Putin to set them off. Uh, they, the, the odds on, uh, I'm not going to set the odds, but, you know, the odds on these reactors going off, even without a conscious uh, hostile act, uh, are, are enormous. We've been talking, we started with Linda Gunter of uh, uh, Beyond Nuclear, uh, we, uh, with Paul Gunter of Beyond Nuclear, and also Joe Mangano of the Radiation and Health Project. This has been an update on the situation in Ukraine. And the problem is nobody else is doing this. Uh, this will be the only in-depth show that you'll have available to you uh, to uh, really explore uh, the, the realities of what we're facing uh, on a daily basis. It is beyond terrifying. Um, uh, I've written seven or eight articles on this. Uh, you can go to readersupportednews.org, rsn.org, progressive.org, uh, downwithtyranny.org, and these articles are picked up at places like uh, BuzzFlash, uh, Smirking Chimp. Um, uh, my, my engineer today has been Steve Caruso, uh, does great work. Join us again next week. Uh, at the. We'll have the Grassroots Emergency Election Protection uh, Coalition. In case you've been wondering why I've been wandering around, uh, uh, I'm in, in my house that I lived in for 35 years and raised our children, and we are leaving uh, this week. So uh, you've been hearing this from an empty house in the middle of Columbus, Ohio, but God forbid, you know, uh, you, you see these people, they look just like uh, a normal regular uh, European Americans, uh, you wonder, uh, the question to ask is, if one and a half million Ukrainians turned up at the, at the uh, border, the southern border of the United States, would Trump build a wall? Um, we have, uh, we're down to the last few minutes here. Uh, Paul and, and uh, Joe, you want to throw in a last word? Uh, also tell us, please, how people can get a hold of you for more information. Uh, Paul Gunter and then Joe Mangano. It's pretty simple. No nukes, no bombs, no dumps. Beyondnuclear.org. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Mangano? Yeah, and I'd like to make a statement too. What we've talked about is, is, is very, very disturbing, but I want to offer a, a statement of hope, positive statement, that we, we can, if the right things are done, avoid these terrible scenarios. Uh, the, the first thing that has been proposed by the Ukrainian government is to you know, declare a, a safe zone. You know, nuclear plants were not designed to, to be involved in, in, in warfare and, and war conditions. That, that has to be done right away. And it has to be done diplomatically. It can't be done by, by, by fighting with, with, with guns. And the, the second thing is, as, as Paul mentioned, as, as nuclear power is phased out. If we reduce the exposures, um, we, can, we, we can improve health. In fact, we've done several articles in the medical literature showing that when nuclear plants shut down in the United States, in, in every case, in the first two years after the shutdown, the local rates of cancer in young children and infant deaths plummet, right? It goes away. And, and the over time, the cancer rates uh, for all ages goes down. So we are we are not all doomed. There there is a way to 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 improve, but that has to be done with a concerted effort that includes our leaders. To know more about our group, go to radiation.org. Radiation.org. Joe Mangano. Thank you, Paul Gunter from BeyondNuclear.org, 
And I will say this, uh, we had the opportunity 50 years ago to win the solar. Uh, the, uh, the wind and solar industries have exceeded all expectations. If uh, Ukraine had been getting its energy, which it easily could, uh, at, like Russia and like the United States, uh, like all of Europe from wind and solar power, none of this would be happening. We would not be in a war. Uh, these are pipeline wars. These are nuclear wars, uh, nuclear powered wars. And uh, there's absolutely no excuse. Uh, thank you again, Steve Caruso, uh, uh, for engineering. Thank you, Progressive Radio Network, uh, the crew in New York. Uh, this has been Harvey Slogo Wasserman. Next week, we'll be back with the, uh, our Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition. In the meantime, <laughs> God help us all and pray for no meltdowns and no nuclear accidents in Ukraine and for peace as soon as we can get it. Thank you. We'll see you next week. You can reach me, by the way. Harvey Wasserman at Solartopia at Gmail, S-O-L-A-R-T-O-P-I-A at gmail.com. And uh, uh, my website is solartopia.org. Uh, my book, uh, The uh, People's Spiral of U.S. History, will be out very soon. Uh, email me for a copy if you want one. Take care, everybody, and no nukes.